Hello, I'm Loreen Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is Elias Rivera, an extraordinary painter, really, really a, a pillar of the arts community in New Mexico. Welcome to the show. It's an absolute pleasure being here. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure to have you. We are yeah. celebrating, in a way, the publication of this wonderful book of yours. It's yeah. Elias Rivera. It just came out, and it is full full. I cannot even show them to you all, but if you can see, absolutely beautiful reproductions of your paintings. I'm still stunned by it. Well, it, it covers most of the periods in your life, doesn't it? It's close to 50 years. 50 years. Yeah. Well, let's look at that life for a minute, because you really have had such dramatically different episodes in your life. You were born in Brooklyn. Of no, Puerto actually born in the Bronx. Oh, born in the Bronx. I'm sorry. P Puerto Rican heritage. Uh -huh. Both parents were born in Puerto Rico, and uh, it was just an, an interesting journey. Uh, starting from the Bronx, we uh, tra it was like gypsies. We traveled around a lot. I never stayed in, a, in an apartment very long, and I literally was working. I have to say this because uh, I'm very involved with that. I worked very early on in my life. I started working when I was, I was two years old. My father was a carpenter. He took janitorial positions and I uh, uh, used to collect the garbage. So for me that's a very important issue because I'm painting people that are constantly working. So there's an identification that I'm a worker like they are. And so that there's no pomposity or arrogance or you know them. I'm totally connected to the same level. And so that I can enter their world knowing what it's about because I it's, I'm still working hard, and I'll always work hard. I'm not a trust fund baby. I have to work for a living, and and uh, fortunately, I'm I'm doing my passion, and I'm following my bliss, as Joseph Campbell says. I've been very fortunate in that way. But in New York, it wasn't. It it's a very beautiful quote that he has. Metaphor. Joseph, I always quote it to young students, young people. He says, when they're confused, uh, follow your bliss. But in that. You have to be very tenacious, and you might have to fight parents, society. At, when I started painting, it was 1955, I entered uh, the Art Citizens League in a world that was totally upside down in relationship to what I was doing. I was a, always a figurative painter. All I knew was to paint and draw people. I wanted to honor the human, the human theater. And it's about us. And at the time, they were telling me, this is, uh, you're out of sync, you're anachronism, stop it. I mean, just, you know, photography's taken over. What are you doing? And it really crushed me because I wasn't prepared intellectually to, to uh, cope with this onslaught, you know. And I said, oh, well, I guess I'm just too stupid. I just have to do what I have to do. And, uh, but the, th the thing about it is that because I had no support either from my mom, who unfortunately didn't understand art. So if I was, I had all kinds of jobs. I had a cabinet making business for a while, I taught dancing for a while, and I, uh, framing business. All of that was fine, okay, because she understood that. But art was a big, big question mark. All she saw me growing my hair long and, oh, I lost my son, he's gone crazy, he's gone, he's gone to pot. But, and I didn't smoke pot, but I didn't mean that. But the thing is that it somehow it, uh, it allowed me to find my inner strength because I had no support from the outside world, neither from the establishment who wanted me to give up painting people because it was not in, or parents, or, you know, and, and it was really difficult to earn a living. I'm not the sharpest guy uh, for negotiating. I was a cabinet maker, and I'd get involved with a job and end up uh, uh, working for $75, uh, 75 cents an hour because if I get my word, I have to do it the way I said it. And uh, so I was very angry. I want to come back to your parents mm -hmm. because even though your mother might not have understood capital A art. Yeah. As a child, I'm sure you did sketches, yeah. really good representations of yeah. family members. Yeah. Well, that's enough to melt anybody's heart. You know, if you see your, your abuelito, a beautiful yeah. drawing, 
And so she couldn't even understand the, the historical context that you were drawing pictures of the family? She knew I was in art. I mean, she, she knew I was in that direction because the fact is that when I was about 10, 8 years old, I had a rheumatic murmur, so she had to put me to bed. And she gave me some clay, and from that moment on, I knew what my destiny was because I started making these figures, you know, uh, and I had the hands. I just did it. And so I knew that without knowing what fine art is, I knew that that was the path. But the context of my experience at that time, culturally, was uh, illustration. So I followed Norman Rockwell, uh, Bob Peake, and all those people until I entered the Art Students League. And then, then I discovered capital C culture and fine arts. And that was a little bit overwhelming to me. Exciting, but again, uh, I always felt that I, n I never questioned my talent, but I questioned my intellectual capacity. I felt I was dumb. Uh, God had played a trick on me. He made me very talented, but dumb. And it was something that I had to live with through years and years because it, I, I used to call it the Black Plague. It used to come through and grab me, and I was catatonic for a month or so with depression. And then I'd wave, wave out of it. But in the meanwhile, I was reading Camus, Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, and all that stuff. Kind of downer lit, if you don't know what I'm saying. So, it, but I mean, they are transcendent ultimately, but, but. But it fit where I was. It fit the mood of the 50s, and especially Camus, and you know, I read a lot of O'Neill, and uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a moment of angst. And that angst gave you juice. And you, you, uh, it was not about making money and making it and all that stuff. It was about finding what it's about, life. And so you'd be... Uh, I mean, it was just a juicy time with, with what I read. And I was right there on the same page. I was depressed. I was angry. So I was reading the appropriate people. I mean, I, I was able to uh, watch uh, uh, three, uh, what's his name, Ingmar Bergman movies. Uh -huh. I can't even go there now because I was in the same room, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was just an appropriate for that period of time. Well, um I wonder if, if in this we have a representation of some of your early work. So you started painting, you were also cabinet making, doing all these other jobs. Mm -hmm. But when did you first start painting? And I'd like to show a few of those early paintings. If I don't know if there's one in here. In I'm this. not sure if there is. Let me see. Uh, no, there no. are behind, behind me. Uh -huh. uh, this, uh, the subway one and the... Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Brooklyn... Uh, restaurant. And I have to say something about that period, too. That period, I never left the house without a sketchbook. And so I was always sketching in the subways and the automats. And I, was, I felt like I'm a movie buff. I, you know that. And I love movies. And, but the, the issue about movies also is that they're dealing with the same issues that I'm dealing with, the theater of people. And they have X amount of space, and they have to make that space interesting, which is lighting, rhythms of light, plastic considerations, you know, lights and darks. And also, a great actor is a, is a truthful actor. So he gets into the inside of, a, of an actor, of a, of a role, and projects his own, identifies with his own experience, and makes it truthful. And I try to do that with my paintings, because when I've been, uh, when I was sketching at that period, I as much watched people, observed them, as I did sketch them, and just felt them, so that that information is within my nervous system, in my DNA at this moment, and so that when I call forth, when I'm doing a uh, painting of somebody in a certain gesture, I'm feeling that gesture, and I've observed and honored human beings most of my life. And so I feel that that's, there's, a, there's an element of help that I've gotten from observing people for so long. Yeah. Um, I recently went to your beautiful eg exhibit at the National Hispanic Cultural Center, yeah. which is a retrospective of mm -hmm. your works. And it starts with those early, there's a one of, called Birmingham, and there's right. a lot of your 
um, subway and the automats and all this, but they also have a series of sketches mm -hmm. where I think you had a job looking after children. Right. And when right. you would put them down for their naps, mm -hmm. you would do these exquisite sketches of these yeah. little faces they're, sleeping. They're, they're adorable. Just Especially when they slept. And then you, there's mm -hmm. a series of self-portraits there, mm -hmm. too. And, um, but I want to I want to move on to your your next phase because you moved west to Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? How did you hear about Santa Fe? How did you? Most people who are in New York really don't think about leaving New York. Well, if I would have left, I would have died, because the if, if you would have left, you would have died. Or if I would have stayed, stayed, I would have, would died, have died. Because uh, I mean, spiritually, emotionally, because I was constantly getting brick walls, career-wise. I mean, I was earning a living and, uh, you know, barely because I was doing something I didn't want to do. So I knew that I wouldn't be pursuing whatever I was doing, cabinet making, framing, whatever. But uh, at a certain juncture, when I decided I had to leave to save my soul, uh, a friend of mine was coming out here. He's a painter, Art, uh, Albert Handel. And he, uh, he was very pivotal in, in helping me come out because... Uh, Actually, he was very pivotal in, th there's an element of New Yorkers that feel that New York is the all end. You can stay there, it represents the world. There's a certain kind of arrogance, okay? And it's a phenomenal city, okay? But uh, if it works for you. And, and for most of the part, it worked for me culturally and, and I was painting the people. And so for me, it fed me my material. But at a certain juncture, it shifted. The energy shifted. And I lost the people. There was a lot of sense of violence and a lot of uh, anger. And I wasn't comfortable uh, sketching in the subways. And the automats were taken over by Burger King. And, and uh, I lost that world. So slowly, I was in a town that was no longer working for me. And I was saying, why am I here? It's like, you know, I'm going around in circles, going nowhere and uh, waiting for Godot, and just nothing was happening. And so what I decided is that I'm leaving, and I wasn't sure, but I was a cabinet, so I fixed my van up, and it had uh, my studio, my music, I never leave without my music, and uh, sleep there, everything. And I was just leaving, okay? And I fixed up, fortunately I had a half a brownstone uh, duplex, and so I fixed that up, that was my rent. I had an income from there. That was, that's what saved my, it really allowed me, that income allowed me to wear one hat instead of multiple hats, mm -hmm. cabinet makers, this, that, 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 and I did everything in my life. I even remember the, uh, Mullen Brand on the waterfront, I did that for, for a few days. You and covered I, the waterfront? <laughs> well, I worked in the, you know, in the waterfront, and, oh. and they, they, were, they were laughing at me because, you know, I was trying to lift these monster 100 pound bags, and it didn't work. So, uh, but the thing is that I just, just left. And uh, when I came here, and La Bahada, and I saw it, it was, I was home. Mm -hmm. It was like an instant love. And I've never lost that love. I am so grateful to this town. I can't believe, you cannot believe it. And the thing is, when I got here, I was already sick with nephritis. I didn't know it. So, which is a very, uh, pretty deadly kidney disorder. And uh, fortunately, <clears throat> I met my wife, and she fell in love with me before I got sick. <laughs> so she became my nightingale, Florence Nightingale, and, and helped me through a lot of difficult uh, periods, you know. And, uh, but at a certain juncture, I realized that I kept on getting sick, and I, uh, I had it, the second time I was in St. Vincent's, and they were feeding me Howard Johnson food, I realized that I had to take responsibility. So I went back, I had a little cottage I went in Delgado Street. I went back to my cottage. I became a macrobiotic. Uh, I took vitamins, and then I did take diuretics. But uh, it was the macrobiotics that shifted, changed the whole thing, boom, I found it. And uh, it was, but again, I, I have to thank Santa Fe for allowing that environment, that spirit to happen that I could feel like I could heal myself in this incredible, extraordinary energy field. Because it's an energy field. It's, well, it's not only place. were you 
physically transformed, but your art, your your yeah. creativity was transformed. Let's look, hold up uh, yeah. one of the Santa Fe pieces, and we'll look at several here. Well, when I met my wife, she was working at the uh, Downs, uh -huh. uh, at the Downs of Santa Fe, and so I did a series of paintings of the Downs, and then I did, uh, where is it? I don't have it, we don't have it here. The portal. The portal. Well, we'll we'll yeah. show that. We'll yeah. show the portal. Yeah. But uh, so you did a series of, of paintings at the Downs with, mm -hmm. and I think some rodeo paintings. Yeah. And then the wonderful ones from the portal yes. and the plaza, which we're showing. Yes. And um, but the, but there was a whole other palette of light that you yeah. hadn't used before. Yeah. yeah. First of all, a couple of things are working here. First of all, the light here and the expansiveness of light is just extraordinary. New York is a mood city. It's dark, it's moody, it's psychological, and it's intense. Uh, but here it's expansive, and I'll just jump for a second. I was here three or four years. I went back to see my beautiful, beautiful duplex, and I felt like I was Alice in Wonderland. It had shifted uh. to the small, because my sense of space had just changed. And, uh, but the, the, the thing is that the, the light here is so extraordinary. I was happy because I was doing one thing. I was pursuing my career because I had an income from my New York apartment, Brooklyn apartment. And, uh, and so that, and also I was home. I instantly felt that I was at home here. And there was, a, there was a support system. And I had an interesting thing. I was sick with my nephritis. And I had, uh, I had gained a lot of weight uh, through edema. I was like close to 200 pounds of edema. And then, uh, I, this is why I was still in, in my, uh, my uh, Delgado Street cottage. And Sue was going to come to visit me, but she didn't know. And she told her friend That's not to... That's your wife, a painter herself? Susan, yes. Susan Contreras, a wonderful painter. And she, she came with her friend and told her friend not to make fun of me. But she didn't realize that I took diuretics and that within three days, I lost about 80 pounds of water. And so I looked like a perfect candidate for uh, Schindler's List because I lost every muscle in my body. So I was a skinny, skinny, skinny thing. But the thing is that it allowed me to transform myself. You just said it's, it's a, it's, it was literally a transformative. Uh, I always felt that about that period that I was letting go of the rage and anger that accumulated in New York City and, and starting fresh, starting a new life. And that was very, very pivotal and very important to me. But as I was sick, I was invited to the Sweeney Center uh, that was having a, um, uh, there was a big, big show, and I was invited. So I, I gave them about six or eight paintings, and I met a very lovely human being, Cecile Muchnik, who was, a, who was a, still a friend, and she repped me for that, for that stay there, and she sold all my paintings. Ah, so and tell me her name again. Cecile Muchnik. Ah, great yeah. name. Yes. And so, um, you we were able to. These were paintings of Santa Fe and the Plaza. Yeah. Because I, I must tell you that that is one of my favorite periods of yours because I work in the state capitol right. in right. long, long hours during the legislature, yeah. and and right outside the House of Representatives they have one of your really beautiful portal paintings. Well, Sometimes thank you so in the much. dead of night. When I've been hearing many, many arguments <laughs> about welfare or Medicaid or something, right. I'll just go sit there, and yeah. I'm so nourished by the colors and by yeah. um, the light in that painting that it's, you know, I, I love yeah. that that phase of yours. But yeah. because of time constraints, let's go on to your next phase. Right. Where did you go? How did you get there? And and show us a little of the next period uh, my, would my, be the Oaxaca period. Yes, my next period was. Uh, as I was getting out of, I still was sick, I was still weak, I was still like this 100-pound uh, weakling, you know, Charles Atlas, uh, this weakling. Uh, I was invited to uh, accompany Susan and her mother, who were going to Oaxaca. And there, I was totally overwhelmed by what I saw, because I had lost my people of New York. And intermittently, I was finding things to paint here. But it is a tourist town, so there's, a, there's not as much material as you would find in a place like Oaxaca or the Tarahumara, and, and especially with the, the most recent one is Guatemala. But, uh, but when I was in, in Oaxaca, I was just, wow, wow, wow. 
wow, I was walking around looking at all this material, and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't an expert in using the camera yet. And so I was hiding it down here and getting weird shots, weird perspectives. But we kept on going back, and slowly I, I got my way of finding my material. And it was just, you know, wonderful. Let's rich. look at some of these Oaxaca. OK, there's, there's one. Oh, here, here's the Oaxaca piece. This is one of the marketplaces there, and behind me there are a couple more. And then uh, right after the Oaxaca, this is the Tarumara, which is uh, northern Chihuahua. And again, they were, that was a wonderful experience. Uh, it's, been, it's been an unbelievable journey. Well, and then let's just mention your, your, your recent, your chapter now is Guatemala. Yeah, I've Guatemala. lived in Guatemala. It is stunningly beautiful. Yes, yeah. And again, your, your paintings, particularly in the flower markets and yeah. with all the women with their beautifully embroidered wheat right. peels. Right. And I each village has a completely different color right. and style. Right. And you've captured that all so beautifully. Have we anything from Guatemala in here? Yes. And then yes. We'll, uh, yes. we'll show several. Yeah. This, uh, this is Guatemala, and this is Guatemala, and then uh, here are the women of Guatemala with the flower market, and then this is another Guatemala piece. Again, it's, uh, I feel like it's an endless uh, candy store for me, and I love the people. There's something, there's a chemistry that happens, it's just like, wow. And you do catch in the individual, just the common person, yeah. you, because yeah. as you yeah. said at the beginning, because you are a worker yourself, yeah. you have, you embrace them in, in right. their full human dignity, right. and you kind of bring forth Right. The human spirit of the old woman with the flowers, or the young child looking at, at her mother, and right. it's it's it's. Um, we don't have much time left. Yeah. We're talking about all these places. We'll do yeah. another show because I've got yeah. a lot more to talk to you about. Okay, okay. But how important is place in terms of of evoking the spirit of people? You have all these different phases, and they're so dramatically different because yeah. of the places. Right. Well, I think that they all have different energy fields and if the energy field speaks to you even within Guatemala there are towns that don't speak to me just the energy isn't right for me and uh, one of my favorite is Almalonga which is essentially a, veg a vegetable marketplace and what they wear and I I'll describe it the first time I was there I went a little earlier and it was just like this porky and bass, they were sweeping the streets, very calm, and little by little there's more activity. Well, I felt like I was in hair, that I had dropped an acid to me, because the, the color was just unbelievable, and the energy, they're, they're wearing this, as you know, with peels that are gorgeous, carrying beets, carrots, flowers. I mean, this is an array. I felt like I was in a psychedelic trip, and it, it just astounded me. And it still astounds me, and uh, and it creates such a joy. While I'm painting it, I'm enjoying it because its color is so healing, and I love these people. Okay, so uh, and it's curious what's happened. I, it happened accidentally because most of the marketplaces are filled with women working, and the men are carrying stuff, but they they disappear mostly. And so I've ended up when I was I'll go backtrack when I was in New York. I was painting mostly older men, the automats, and some women. And then I went through this, all these phases, and I ended up recently painting and honoring women, mostly. And it just, you know, it just happens. And uh, so it's, it's very interesting that where, where you're taken. I always feel like you're taken somewhere on a journey. And, and uh, one of your paintings at the National Hispanic Cultural Center of, of these women with these flowers is called yeah. Flowers of the Earth. Yeah. And it's not the flowers you're talking about. Yeah. It's these beautiful right. women that, right. that are blooming there right. on, your camp, right. on your canvas. Right. Right. Uh, another thing I want our viewers yeah. to know about, you have a DVD. It's yes. called Elias Rivera, Through the Eyes of a Master. Yeah. And it's, uh, I, for me, I, I love watching this because it shows you painting. Yeah. And, I'm not an artist, but the sureness with which you lay down these blocks of colors and the yeah. light and shadow sculpting the faces, yeah. it was just astonishing for me yeah. to see this. And also you, you're friends with Gene Hackman yes. and several other artists who speak about your work and, yeah. and 
um, what they've learned from watching you work and, yeah. and looking at works. The other thing I also want to mention is this extraordinary book called Elias Rivera. It's a compilation of really close uh, to 50 years. 50 reproductions of 50 yeah, years yeah, yeah. of painting. Yeah, yeah. So um, I thank you for being with us today. We oh, have much, much more to talk yeah, about. Yes. Um, can you leave us with some thoughts on light and color? Because that to me is a, um, the strongest element of your work. Well, I, I feel very strongly that we're in dire need of metaphoric light. And I honor light very sacredly. It's, it's, uh, and I think that it just permeates my, my world of painting because when I'm, uh, I use it for orchestral reasons, and that's going back to, the, uh, to Rubens and Vermeer, all of these. My legacy is immense that I still tap, to, that tap into, and I honor them profoundly. And they're still my guides. I, I call forth their spirits to help me while I'm painting. And uh, so light is crucial to my, to my work. And it's uh, also so delicious that progressively my paintings have become more and more filled with light. The moods of New York were darkish. They were, it's about light, but it was like more of a psycho psychological world. And uh, are we have time? Or yeah, yeah, I just want you to, to tell if we're coming west and then to these indigenous peoples and these beautiful, what kind of light you found, say, oh. in Guatemala and Oaxaca. Oh, it was, for, for me, the, the light there was more imbued with what they were wearing. And uh, it just, it, it, it had as much to do with their spirit and what they wore and the color that was so unique and so, for me, mind-boggling. And I, was, I never considered myself a colorist. And a lot of people would say, oh, Elias, so he's, he's he just, he, what he does amazingly with color. And this is absolutely new to me, because in New York, I was a value painter. And I'm glad I was, because it's, it's a very solid background, a solid uh, structure. But with the introduction of that world to me, it's just I, I explored this world of ecstatic color, which is unbelievably healing. Yes, it yeah, is, and yeah. I thank you for bringing us this yeah. world of well, ecstatic. It's, it's, it's my honor to do it because I feel like uh, I'm following orders when I'm painting. Well, uh, they are definitely from a higher, higher most, vibration, most, higher resonance. Most definitely. I want to thank you. Our guest today is Elias Rivera, yes. um, painter and ambassador of light. Thank you for joining us. So beautifully put. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Lorreen Mills. I'd like to thank you, our viewers, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week.